after it should only take you a couple minutes, um, one student was talking to me and was a little bit worried that it was going to be like a paper that you had to write. And I'm an English teacher. As much as I love signing long papers, uh, that's not what this assignment is. It should just take you a couple of minutes. But make sure you complete the response assignment after every presentation you attend. Uh, also, we're, we keep updating the calendar in Canvas for cultural events you can attend. Four or five of you have already submitted a cultural event survey. Uh, and so go to the planetarium, go, go to the plays, go to the concerts. Uh, there's art shows opening. There's all sorts of things that you can do this semester. Remember, you need to attend three of those, one in each category. And Convocation Plus, if you're wanting that extra credit, is starting this week. So uh, it's, it's kind of your last chance to get into that class if you're interested. Send me an email or talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. I'm uh, thrilled to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Mar her name is Margaret Blair Young. And this morning as I was getting ready, I pulled three of her books off my shelf that I've had. Uh, this is kind of, for a book lover, just it's like Nirvana, that have so, uh, someone who I've read their work come and speak to us here on campus. And so I'm, I'm so glad that she accepted our invitation. Uh, Margaret Blair Young is a writer and a filmmaker uh, who actually knows little about film, but who has a good eye for people uh, who, knows, who know more than she does. She's written six novels, two short story collections, two plays, as well as uh, several screenplays. The screenplays are being or have been filmed in the country where she does her humanitarian work, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. She has a magnificent, magnificently supportive husband who never suspected that his wife would start jumping to different continents during her almost golden years. She and her husband have four children and nine grandchildren, and her oldest son, Rob, is teaching here at Snow College this semester. And Rob's wife, Heather Holland, uh, is teaching as well and has been hired as, a, as an instructor in the English department. Uh, the past president of Snow College, Scott Wyatt, uh, was, one of, was the one who urged Margaret to go to, I, I should pronounce this, Loja, uh, DRC, and was with her on many of her trips there. Uh, Margaret's fluent in Spanish and has taken her children to teach in Guatemala several times. She can converse in French. Uh, which is what they speak in the, one of the languages they speak in Congo. Uh, but she refuses to attempt to spell it, which is probably good. There's just a lot of extra vowels, it seems like, when I'm trying to spell French. Uh, though she has taught crea creative writing at BYU for 34 years, the new connections to Snow College make her feel very much welcome here in Ephraim. And I hope we can continue that welcome. Would you uh, please join me in, in welcoming her to the stage? Thank you so much. Okay, can you, can you see my little PowerPoint thing? Starting catalysts and caterpillars. Whoops, I think I just messed it up. Okay, I, I, maybe we're okay. Can you, you, can, you can hear me all right? Okay, so, so obviously we're gonna talk about caterpillars. So let me just start off with the question that you were probably wondering about for your classmates. How many of you have eaten caterpillars? Just clap. <laughs> How many of you would like to? Okay, we, we can make that happen. I have had them dished up on my plate. I have decided that I don't need to eat caterpillars to have, be fulfilled in this life. So I haven't actually eaten them, but some of my best friends eat them. Uh, and I'm going to use them as a metaphor for, for what I'm uh, going to be talking to you about today. Uh, so the title, Caterpillars and Catalysts, and I'm going to talk about particular people that we work with that are catalysts for change among the others in, in their country. When you hear, if, if somebody says, I work in or I live in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you may immediately think, isn't that where they have Ebola? Uh, yeah, but that's on the east. And isn't that where there's a lot of war? Absolutely, which is why we do what we do. The place where we work, Loja, that the former president of Snow College, Scott Wyatt, told me about, uh, was in a war 16 years ago. And so we, we are working to do exactly what you're doing right now. 
which is to expose them to ways to get their imagination back. When somebody, when somebody is working in a country that has been traumatized by war, they will lose their imagination. They will work on a 24-hour cycle. What can I do in the next 24 hours? How can I get money in the next 24 hours? Instead of, how can I imagine a future? What are the possibilities that are open to me? What you're doing right now in hearing somebody who doesn't actually teach at this university, but who is coming to visit to give you some ideas, and I'm, they've asked me specifically to talk about humanitarian work and why we do what we do and how we identify the people we can work with. So I'll be doing that. But the fact that you're here in this magnificent facility, I'm going to be telling you about Abbe Viron, a Catholic priest in the DR Congo. Uh, we took him to Southern Utah University because Scott Wyatt is now the president of that university and showed him an auditorium like this, and he almost fainted. He said, oh, if we could have something like that in the Congo. He's a playwright. He's done remarkable work in his own life, but the people who he supervises, he's the rector of the university there, uh, have nothing except what we brought. Uh, and, and that wasn't very much at all. But when we gave art supplies to our students and taught them how to do a few things, all of the sudden, we saw those who were willing to spend some time revealed a magnificent imagination and great talent. So my next one, Lion King. Here are actual caterpillars. And then the phrase from Lion King, uh, which is slimy yet satisfying. So the question, is it true they never become butterflies? I have a godson who lives in the Congo, he's Congolese, and uh, he, he told me that the caterpillars they eat are meant to be eaten, that they never turn into butterflies. And my thought was, that would be kind of counter nature because caterpillars are created to turn into butterflies. But he assured me that these caterpillars didn't. But the last time I was in Loja, this, this past April, I was in a field where there were hundreds of white butterflies. And the man who was showing me around said, these are what the caterpillars become if they don't get eaten. So the title of my presentation, Failing into Flight, not falling, but failing, because I am going to talk very directly about failure, because we have failed a number of times in what we've done. But as we've identified the catalysts in the country, the ones who we can really work with, who have already launched themselves, but who were awaiting a little more fuel, uh, we've, we've, we've learned how to move beyond failure and to even not be discouraged by failure. Let me give you an example of something we did. This is the inside of a truck that we sent to the Congo because the priest told us what he really needed was a truck. And we were able to get four incubators. They, they lose premature babies all the time. Uh, and the doctors there told us that they really needed incubators. So we got them. But notice what it says, just because you got to the border doesn't mean you reached the destination. We sent the truck there last October, it is still at the border. The, the border guards want bribes, we've paid one bribe and have decided we're not going to continue paying bribes, it appears that there will, keep, there will be new bribes all the time. So kind of that let us know, this is not going to be the avenue that's going to work. Part of our mindset is, finding the avenues that open more doors. And it's not just the first door, because we got the truck to the border. Then the door needs to be open for us to get it to where it actually does some good. So you can identify a first door approach, but if that door doesn't lead to other doors that will make a difference, you haven't finished your, your journey. So I'm gonna start off by telling you the story of Chopper Kabambi. You can see him in the first photo like he's holding something. So let me, let me tell you about Congo. Uh, there is an Institute of Arts, but no film program. At least there hasn't been. I'm not sure if they've followed up on what Chopin did, but that we do now have film. So the Chopin story, he went to class in the National Institute of Arts and said, I want to study film. The response was, we don't have a film program. You have to be rich if you're gonna make films, and you're poor. So, of course, we don't have a film program. So that could have been enough for most people to say, oh, all right, then I'll choose something else. But it wasn't for Chopin. He had decided early on, and I want you to think, maybe some of you are quietly keeping goals that you might not even have told anybody about, because they sound so 
beyond what anyone would imagine. Well, Chopin had dreamt of being a filmmaker from the time he saw his first film, and there are no cinemas in Congo, zero. So they would see them if somebody had a television set, they could get a film made in America or in Europe that was dubbed, or, or in India, and they could see it dubbed in French. So he had seen a Bollywood film and thought, that's what I want to do, I want to make films. So his answer, after he was told, there is no film program here, you have to be rich to make films, was to start it himself. So he literally carried a television set that had a VHS port. Do you remember those from when you were a little kid, where you could plug in a VHS tape and watch a movie? So he brought that to the school every day. He didn't leave it at the school. Theft was a, an issue. And so he would bring it several walk, walking several kilometers a day uh, from, from his home to the, to the National Institute of Arts, and they would watch films and critique them and figure out what was going on. What are they doing with lighting? What are they doing with the, with the characters there? So I had Chopin pose as though he were carrying a television to show what he did at the National Institute of Arts. Well, indeed, he eventually was able to get a camera. It wasn't a terribly good camera, but it made film. So he took that camera out. He, he, was, he rented it, by the way. He, he didn't have the money to buy it. A rented camera, and he went to start filming, and he was thrown into jail. When he, he described in awful detail what it was like to be in jail. He said, basically, everybody got one bathroom trip a day, so they would just relieve themselves within the jail, jail cell. So it smelled terrible. And he was there with people who were there for murder, for all sorts of things. He had committed the crime of not requesting permission to do filming, whatever the reason was that he was arrested for. Uh, that was the charge against him. He had no way of letting his family know that he had been put in jail. He had no way of letting anybody know that he had been put in jail. But a friend had an uncle who worked there. And the uncle finally arranged for Chopin to get out. And Chopin's decision at the end of this time was, I will not make film. I'm, I'm giving that dream up. It is too hard. I can't take these consequences. So he told his friend that, and the friend said, you never talked about anything else in your life but making film. You have to make film. Well, the middle picture is that friend, Dudu, who's with Chopin. Ultimately, Chopin went back and started making films and submitting them to festivals. He submitted them, because you can submit online. You don't have to get a visa and travel to another country. But he actually made a short film called Mbote, which won Best Picture in a Francophone award, meaning a French-speaking award in Belgium. So the last picture is of him holding the trophy that he got. That was his beginning. That was in 2014. So five years ago, this past year, we made a feature film. And uh, I, I won't tell you a whole lot about that because we're going to be talking about other stories, but just letting you know that he chose not to give up on that dream and that his friends mattered in that decision. So that's one of the things you get to do, is to be a friend, to help, help your friends keep their imaginations alive and, and to avoid discouragement. So the, one, the story we're going to tell is of Chopin's mother. So you can see her when she was about 18 years old. Uh, she was born in 1965. You can see her when she's in her 30s, and you can see her as she looks now. One of the things that we do as part of our uh, I, actually, I'm going to give you an email address now because Professor Allred said that you don't have to give a long response. However, I want to give you the option of giving a long response. So you can write down this email address, and if you want to write me an essay, I'll, I'll give you the questions as the, the right before the, the end of the presentation. Feel free to send me an essay asking about if you're a catalyst or if you know people who are catalysts and we'll describe what that means as, uh, throughout the, the, the presentation. So the, the address is DR Congo Rising, DR Congo Rising at gmail.com. Uh, no caps on any of that. And that will go directly to me, and I'd be happy to even grade it as I would grade an English paper, or just give you ideas of what you might do if you get excited by possibilities for humanitarian service. So we interviewed Celestine, Chopin's mother, to create this book because when we tell somebody's story, we are also giving them the message, your life matters. We care enough about you to give you the story. We did oral histories for both of his parents. The father had been accepted into a wonderful university in Belgium, 
but this was during a time where people fought each other instead of helping each other. And the person who had arranged for the scholarship to be given decided that he would send his own son instead of Albert, Cabrera's father. So Albert was denied the education that he had been promised. After we gave him his book, and I'm going to show you Celestine with her book. I, I taught book binding as well as oral histories, uh, which again is a way of giving a sol solid evidence that your life matters. And when there are pictures, we would put them in, the pictures from the life, such as I just showed you of Celestine. Uh, so I gave a book to Albert that was his life story, fascinating life story. And after we left, Albert called his son Chopin and said, well, it's been a hard life. I was cheated out of my education. I've been very poor for all of my life. But look where we are now. You're making movies, and there's a book about me. It meant so much to him to have somebody pay attention to his life story and turn it into a book and then give him the book. So this is Celestine with the book I gave to her. I'm going to tell you just a little of it. So when Scott Wyatt, uh, I'll actually go to the next photo. This is, isn't Loja beautiful. It is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. So Scott Wyatt, who was the president of Snow College for a while, while he was president, went to Loja. I met him a year after he had gone there, and he was at Southern Utah University, where he's the president now. And he told me that I should go to Loja. Well, I had never heard of Loja, but it sounded interesting, and his experience there sounded really interesting. Um, so I, I decided that I would do that. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one of a, a picture from one of our trips. Let's see if this one works. Whoop, let's see. I, I didn't. Can you see that? So those of you who know Scott, can you see him in the very back there, jumping up and down? So this is, the, this is Eric Levitt, one of the minister, government ministers. So this is outside their hotel where they are just, the, the Congolese are dancing and playing music. And Eric Levitt, who's on the board at SUU, and Scott Wyatt, former president of Snow, now president of SUU, just dance and jump right along with it. It was a celebratory moment. Uh, and, and, and we were excited about what we were going to do. Now, remember that I'm talking about failing into flight. So just because we wanted to do it doesn't mean, doesn't mean it happened, like the truck that we sent that got stuck at the border, which is, is a way of, that's my metaphor for crawling. If you're stuck at the border, you're not going very far. You're not flying at this point. Uh, so this, this is a picture of my godson, Emi Mbui, and a picture of my brother. I went with every intention of going to Loja, as, as Scott Wyatt had, had told me to do. Uh, and I was there and realized, if I'm to go, I actually have to meet a government official who I don't trust. So I think I'm not going to go. And I told my godson that I had decided not to go to Loja. My brother was still in France. He had gone to visit his daughter in England. And his passport had been stolen. So he's stuck in France. I'm in Congo. He was supposed to be with me, but he doesn't have a visa. So we do one avenue after another to get his visa, and then it becomes clear I need to meet with this particular government official. The door is open to me to meet with him. Though I'm concerned about it, I decide that I'm going to meet. He meets with me. He's from the Loja area and gives me a ticket to fly to Loja. So I am literally flying at this point. Even though we've been stuck for several weeks with my brother without a passport, or a, the passport's restored, but not the visa, and then I go. I am on my way to Loja. I step off the plane and meet Abbe Véron. Let me go to the next one. Being stuck, here are some possible responses. There, there are two that I've identified. There are many more, but here are two. Isn't this interesting? That's a really good response to something that you hadn't expected that feels like an absolute failure. It feels like you maybe are not going to be able to recover from the fall. Isn't this interesting? I wonder what new paths I'm headed to. So think of a caterpillar realizing that something has changed and something is happening, maybe something uncomfortable. Or, I want to die, please eat me. Which is the way that you won't make it into the, the next doorway. So I go to Loja. I'm by myself. My brother, uh, the visa doesn't permit him to go to Loja with me, so I'm by myself. I'm told that I'm to meet Abbé Viron. This is the Abbé. The Abbé means father in, in, in French, abbot. Um, he is a remarkable man. 
one who did a PhD in France and was given a huge award of 60,000 euros as a prize for the PhD thesis he did. He takes me around to see his schools. Uh, this is me. The, when, when I'm in Congo, I periodically go all Africa and do the dreads because it's actually a little difficult to live without water, and the, the dreads make it so I don't have to wash my hair every day. So I'm with the children. They're sitting on stones, and the Abbe is telling me about what he's been able to do with the funds that he has. I start recognizing him as somebody who can really make a difference and somebody who we want to work with. In uh, one of the most significant things, as we started working with Abbe, and a friend of mine came down who's an artist who brought all these art supplies so that we could teach the students how to do art. Now consider, they were in the war 16 years ago, so all of their parents were traumatized by the war. Many of the, our students themselves started their lives during war. Nothing could be absolutely guaranteed, not even your life the next day. So we realized that art, as a builder of imagination, as a, a teacher, that you can imagine something beyond what's apparently here. I can give you colors and paint possibilities, and you can create something that's not what you just immediately see. And the students did that. So one of the things that the Abbe wanted was for us to get a wheelchair for a young woman. I've, I've got her pictured here. Her legs didn't work at all. I had an experience yesterday that fits in with this beautifully. I took my granddaughter to the Provo Rec Center, and we, we do this whenever I babysit her. We, we go swimming. So we were swimming, and there was a, a young man who clearly had been born with serious handicaps. His legs didn't work. And they, put, they lowered him into the swimming pool to also swim. And my granddaughter saw him and said, he doesn't have legs. And I said, well, he has legs. They just don't work. And she burst into tears. That idea that things could go so terribly wrong was apparently a new concept to her. I don't know what all of her thoughts were. She's not even three. She won't be three until September 15th. But the facing the reality that your legs don't necessarily work, that things can happen. Oh, did we just lose it? OK. Well, I, we assume that it'll come back on. So the pictures that you're going to see will be this young woman uh, who's, first of all, just sitting outside the church. Not at, she crawled to get from one place to another. The, the wheelchair that the Abbe, whoops. Uh, I think I might need to, I'm not on, I'm not on the PowerPoint. These are, these are my students doing art. So it's a, it's a nice thing, but it's not the PowerPoint. So I'm just going <laughs> to. Are we? There we go. And then we just. Yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. Start slideshow, current slide. Yeah. No? Nope. Yep, there we are. So you can see the chair. Uh, we had to have a very thick chair because the roads aren't paved in Loja. But the big thing to me, uh, first of all, a beautiful thing to see this young woman. This is when we first met her, where she didn't know that we were going to, that we had the funds and we were going to be able to get a wheelchair for her. It was presented to her during mass, but it was afterwards that she actually got in the chair. The, the people around her lifted her into this chair. This is an effort of a community. But then watching the crowd, can you see this large crowd around her? There was a gasp as she got in the chair, and she's just weeping. The possibility of something that she hadn't imagined, that she would be lifted beyond her immediate capabilities and would actually be able to be moving without crawling was enormous to her. But the celebratory feeling of the whole community as they witnessed one of their own being put into a place that would make her much better where she would have potential beyond what she already had. Abbe Veron, this is a picture of him as a young, very handsome soccer player, the first one. But he moved beyond that, and, and the next picture shows him there. That's at the same crowd where they've given the wheelchair to the young woman. 
because of the things that he learned, because of the ways that he was able to bless those, and because he cared about his community, not just about himself, that communal connection mattered deeply to him and still does. It is still a part of what he sees himself doing. And then the last picture is of him as a priest in Catholic Mass. He decided that that would be the best way for him to serve his people was through a religious order. And so that, that became a part of his life. The priesthood is kind of his framework for how he does everything. He is also the re rector of the university there. But as he feeds the community spiritually, he's also taking care of them in other ways. Now, there's more to be done. And that's why people from other countries become deeply important, because we have access to things that they simply don't have access to. Our responsibility is to find ways where we're feeding thousands. That, that through people who are already working there and who have a vision of the future, such as Chopin, such as Abbé Véron, that we're able to reach many others. Now, we had a plan to do a film set in the Congo, but my sense was they won't really know how to do movies there, so we better take a film team. So this is me with our film team in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. They are brilliant men, and we're still working with, with them, uh, with at least two of them. Uh, we, I thought this was how we were going to do it. Their reaction to Congo was, there's no infrastructure here. We can't do a film here. Watch out for the words, we can't, because there are ways around them. So the whole idea, we have to go to South Africa. And we actually went to South Africa and looked at some possible locations for filming. But the time came when I said, I'm going to do something else. I think we can do it in the Congo. And then I hired Chopin. Here we are. This is the place where Chopin and his team meet. It's his home. There is electricity once a week, so they would schedule their meetings for when electricity would be present. Just imagine, put yourself in that situation. Here, there are lights, you've got internet. There are things that you just take for granted because you are here at Snow College. You're here in Utah in the United States of America. They cannot be taken for granted in, in the Congo. Uh, he has a little toilet that's not really a toilet. It's, it's more like, like what you would see at a campsite um, and frequently deals with typhoid fever. So here we are with Chopin, who has decided that he's going to make film, and I let him know we'd like you to direct our film. This is enormous. Plus, we send him good equipment. He, he has two little girls. We sent him, I don't know how many of you know film, but we sent him a Black Magic Ursa Mini. We actually sent him two so that it could be multiple. He, we looked at a number of possible cameras and decided that that would be our best option. So he, my brother, uh, on, on one of our last trips to Congo, takes him the cameras, and Deborah, his wife, watches him take the camera and start looking through the lens, and she says to her daughter, Paxi, your father has a new baby now. The whole possibility of making film with good equipment. And then we found him an office that had constant internet, which was significant. Right now, uh, he's just moving back into it. We had a space where he didn't have it. But these are things that are not taken for granted in the Congo. So having internet so that you can reach the things you need to reach, a good computer, which we also sent so that you can edit well, all of these things had to be provided. That's what we who are opening access have to pay attention to. What is actually required for the doors we're opening to open other doors? The fact that Chopin was concerned about, again, that word community, that he wasn't just making movies so that he would get a big name for himself and he could show everybody his trophy. They would take film to orphanages and try to get children excited about a life that was better than what they had received by being born to parents who either died soon after their birth or uh, being taken into an orphanage for other, for other reasons. And he started doing workshops. He put on a film festival every year, Kikin Film Festival, Festival International Kinshasa, uh, where, where people would learn how to make movies. So it wasn't just so that he could be a great filmmaker, but so he could empower the others. That's what we're looking for. The catalyst 
who can ignite a flame of possibility in the other people he works with. If you've read David Brooks's Second Mountain, which is a fairly new book, First Mountain is where you're self-involved, you're concerned about how you can progress, what, what great things you can do personally. Second Mountain is where you move into the community and work on uplifting others. So what we knew as we hired Chopin to do the film is that he had the skills, but we also had the story of his mother. Did I mention that his mother had been born near Loja? When Scott was with us, which was 2018, Scott Wyatt, uh, we went to Loja, and I decided that we should film some B-roll in Loja, meaning the, the scenery roll uh, for our film. So I told Chopin, I called him the day before and said, uh, we're picking you up at 6 o'clock in the morning, we're going to Loja. So we did it. He was not, it was pretty short, uh, a very short time, but here's another picture of Loja. So we're in Loja with Chopin. And then he gets an unexpected phone call. And remember the pictures I showed you of the beautiful woman, Chopin's mother, Celestine? This is her with her grandmother, who looks a lot like her aunt. And Chopin gets a call telling him, did you know your aunt is here in Loja? Now, this is a door that we hadn't anticipated. My, I, I am a theist. I believe in God. I believe that we had always been a part of a divine plan to reunite this family, to have something where, where there would be a, a great at one of, of the family. Celestine uh, had been born to a mother who died right after the birth. The mother had heroically led her family into places where only she could get because it was during the independence movements of the Congo, it was dangerous. There were rival tribes who wouldn't allow passage. And you had to, in order to pass the checkpoints, you had to speak a particular language, which she spoke and which her husband did not. So she was the guide. But the, the time came where they were cast out of the village, and she ran, went into labor, and delivered the baby, who was Celestine, and then she died. The family was heartbroken. They went back to the village to meet their deaths, really, because they decided there was really no reason to continue on. And so they decided they would leave the baby behind and return to the village. So it was Celestine who was abandoned in the forest. And the family went back to be killed and were told, we're not going to kill you. So a couple of days had passed. And the big question is, is the baby still alive? And uncle went back for the baby. It had been four days. She had been abandoned for four days when he went back. And she was alive. The aunt, the one who we're told lives in Loja, came in to take care of this little girl, this abandoned baby, and raised her for the first decade of her life. And then Celestine was sent away for her education, and the aunt continued to live in Loja. Chopin had never met his great aunt, the woman who had raised his mother, and she, Celestine, had not seen her in 40 years. So they had been separated for longer than most of you have been alive. This phone call that Chopin got telling him that his aunt was in Loja was overwhelming. We got to go meet this great aunt who had raised his mother. And you can, you can see a picture, an archival photo that we have of her back at the time when she was raising Celestine. Chopin, as he was talking to his aunt, and by the way, he did not speak her language. It's a different language in Loja than it is in other places. So he had somebody translate for him. But he looked at us and said, I can't tell you what I am feeling. I am very happy. Again, the connection, the community. We were connecting him with the people who had made a difference in his mother's life. In fact, had saved her life and then prepared her for what the rest of the life would be. Um, when we went back to our hotel, he started weeping with this, the reality that he had met the woman who had saved his mother's life. So the key, and I've got pictures of Chopin and a picture of Abbe Véron, find a catalyst, somebody who is already working with others to move forward. Now, remember when I told you about Chopin going to the National Institute of Arts and announcing that he wanted to be a filmmaker and being told, you can't make films, you're poor. You have to be rich to make films. Well, in this first picture, before we started making what we call Ashwa, part of Africa, 
uh, I went to meet the people at the National Institute of Arts. The person in the middle is named Elbas, and he's the one who told Chopin, you can't make films, you're poor. The second picture is from our film, Heart of Africa, and Elbas is one of the stars. He, pl he plays a revolutionary leader, Mwadila. So this very man who said, you can't do that, those scary words again, is in the film, and then says to Chopin, this is going to work. And not only that, I have a film I want to make, and then starts telling the story. Suddenly, he is empowered with a possibility he hadn't considered before. He believed what he said to Chopin, that he couldn't make movies because he wasn't rich. You have to be rich and probably American or European in order to make movies. So he started, he came up with a story that he wanted filmed. We haven't done that one yet, but it's coming. Um, in April, we flew Celestine to meet her aunt and others of her family who lived in Loja. She had not spoken the language since she was 10. So it was kind of childish, and people kind of made fun of her that she wasn't terribly fluent in the language. But we reunited this woman who had been abandoned as a baby and who people thought would die. When they left her in the forest, they thought she would die. They thought they would die. The possibility of life as they turned back to return to the village to offer themselves to be killed was not a reality. It was a death scene. But it all changed. That's one of the big things. At the moments where you think there is no hope, there is no possibility, everything can change. And this moment of reunion was, was a huge moment in Celestine's life. I'm actually going to show you the, the reunion itself. Um, I might need help getting it on the, on the computer. But let me go to the next one. This is the one where I told you you can do a little bit more than the response essay. So these are the questions. And if you want to answer one of these at length, if you're dying, if you were really disappointed when Professor Allred said this is not a long paper, and you said, ah, I want to write a long paper. Well, you can do it for me at drcongorising at, at gmail.com. Uh, who do you know who is a catalyst? Think of the earth shakers, the, the movers, people who you've watched overcome odds that you thought were not a possibility. Are you a catalyst? Uh, I'm just going to have to read it for, for uh, I lo we lost it again, so I'm just going to read it for you. Are you a catalyst? Would you like to be one? What steps can you take to begin that metamorphosis? If you're a caterpillar, are you willing to become a different creature? If you encounter someone who seems like a caterpillar, can you discern their possibilities and help them pursue a glorious future? Now, let me, let me see if I can access our um, Racine, the, the actual reunion when we, let's see if this comes up okay. No input is required, is, is recorded? Okay. So this is our, this is our film, N not, this is the film we're still making. Uh, hold on, let's, let's hold off until we, we can actually get that. So you're going to get to see the moment of reunion when Celestine sees the great, the, her aunt, who she hasn't seen in 40 years, but who raised her as, as a child when everybody had given up on even the possibility of her surviving. Everything changed. We're, we're still not quite there yet. So I, 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 I can see it on my screen, but you can't see it there. So I'm just going to hold it here. Are we almost there? It's searching for something. Are we, oh, no, we've, we've got that. Now if we can just get it to this, the film. Racine, do you know what Racine means? How many French speakers do I have? Who knows Racine? It means root. So Celestine, it's Deborah, Chopin's wife, who's actually heading up the, the documentary, and she decided that it would be called root, singular, the, the whole idea of rootedness. Okay, which one? Um, so it's going to be this one. 
have we got it yet? I might, I might just need to, we still don't have it. I can just turn the, the computer around. It's, it's hard to see. I'd be happy to provide the footage. We actually have a 10 minute excerpt from the documentary we're doing, but if, it's hard to see it very well, but Celestine is approaching this woman and then they just scream and shout. The, after they're just here, they're just crying as they embrace each other and walk in this embrace back to the house. And then we have reunions for the rest of the day. And then the, what I'm hearing here is the crying. It goes on for a long time the, because of the, the distance. And nobody had thought this could happen. So important. Nobody imagines the possibilities that you have in your future. Maybe not even you. And, and at times where it feels like everything has fallen apart, everything has been disrupted, and you're just crawling like a caterpillar, the possibility of those wings are absolutely present. The things that happen to bring you to the peak moments of your life, the pivotal moments where you become a catalyst for others, which is what we are actually aiming for. It's not where you become famous and where people give you a standing ovation. It's where you are empowered to turn around and help others, second mountain. Yeah. So the, the, the questions that I, that I gave you about, are you a catalyst? You know somebody who's a catalyst. If you are crawling right now, if you've just gone through a disruption, at this age, there are a lot of disruptions that we go through, meaning your age. At my age, there are a few, but, but I'm, they're a little greater, I think, when you're, when you're in, in your 20s. Um, because there are going to be marriage possibilities, career possibilities, and sometimes you can even be a, a afraid to dream very big. Well, as we've looked at the people that we can help, uh, as, as we've recognized the real catalysts who are moving things in the Congo, and as we've fueled them to do what they were already doing, we've done the work, it's a, a godly work. We've done the work of giving them wings. We talk about chasin, which is roots and wings. Give your children roots and wings. The groundedness, they are centered in home, family, the wings, they have limitless possibilities. I'm going to open it up to questions now, particularly if you want to ask me about humanitarian service. Um, I should mention Elias James is a, teaches here. He did the score for the film Heart of Africa. That's Elias. <laughs> Do you, do you have questions? Yes. No, I had already been doing it. I had already, I was already, but, but honestly it started from the time I was a baby. Uh, when I was eight years old, my father is a Mayanist. My father has passed away now, but he's still a Mayanist. Uh, it may be irrelevant where he is, but he studied dialects, various dialects. And so when I was eight, I had my first trip to Mexico. When I was 19, we went to Guatemala. And I, after hating it for about six months, I fell in love with it. Some of you are going to experience that same thing with roommates, with marriages, with college. Uh, you know, they, there are times of feeling stuck and like you're, you're not going to be able to progress in the environment you're in, and then suddenly you figure out how to make it work. So I fell in love with, with the people I was with and then returned six times, taking my children, uh, several of my children with me. And in fact, my daughter, who's a great singer, did concerts there in Guatemala. Uh, we taught at a little school. We taught English. Is Adriana here? Ah, Adriana. <laughs> so she's her, we work with her father who my father had helped learn Kachikel, the, the dialect that's spoken in the area where we are. Um, so it was a lifestyle for us in our family to kind of be fearless about crossing borders, uh, to not really worry about languages. You know, the, all of the things that you say, I can't possibly do it because, and then you make your list, I'm going to have to learn a new language. Well, the way you learn a new language is to step into it and be willing to fail. Because you don't, if you go thinking, how do you conjugate that? What? Okay, the word order, I, I don't even know how to spell that. You are failing to communicate right then. 
you move in and you start communicating, and the children will come and help you. And that way, you make friends. It, it's an invitation. The fact that you are flailing in the language is actually an invitation for friendships to happen. So it becomes the opening to the community you want. So my daughter, Julie, did a couple of concerts in uh, the place where we were, Chimaltenango, Guatemala. Uh, my Spanish got good. I certainly couldn't do it when I first started, but I knew the Blair philosophy, that my dad's philosophy, that you just jump in and just be willing to make a fool of yourself. It's something that, especially as people get older, it becomes more and more daunting. The idea that you would appear foolish is a really scary thing. But if you're willing to move across borders, you actually have to take that as a part of your daily challenge. I am willing to look really stupid. I am willing to make a fool of myself. I'm probably going to say really stupid things. But if I'm going to get fluent, and if I'm going to become a part of this community, I'm going to have to do it. Other questions? Yes. I don't know what Snow College has. Um, there are enormous opportunities, and I'd be happy to connect you to, to right now in the Congo, uh, the, the opportunities are a little bit limited because there are liability issues with the Congo. Uh, President Wyatt has wanted to stand, send students there and twice has been on the point of doing it, and both times it's fallen through. And I think largely the issue is liability that colleges and universities need to be aware of. But there are programs in Ghana, there are programs in Guatemala. If you want to do what we did and help Julio Salazar in Chimaltenango, I think that way could probably be open for you. Uh, where, where are other places that you have humanitarian service? Chimaltenango, El Colegio Mesoamericano. Yeah, yeah. Which is a wonderful place. And it's not, you know, when we, when we do our work in Congo, we are really third world. I, I've called it third world minus, because it's, uh, in Guatemala, we actually do have water, and a nice little place when I've gone down, they've, the, Julio has arranged for me to stay in a little house with my family. Not much that I don't have there. And I'm able, that's another thing, is to be willing to live outside of your comfort zone. So even in Congo, I'm willing to live in a way that's not comfortable. Uh, and that's part of my expression of, again, that community. I'm willing to do things the way you do them, instead of insisting that you do things my way. Uh, and, and it's sort of the way that we went about making the movie. Uh, I'm, I've decided that you should tell the story. And in fact, we, as, as Chopin worked on it, we said, no, this is co-authored. You have brought enough into this project that this is co-authored. And we're doing it in your dialect, so you people need to be in charge of translation. So once, once we're there, uh, I don't know if you're aware of accusations of appropriation that are really prominent right now. I read a complaint about a movie shot in Ethiopia that's about white people in Ethiopia. And the complaint was, if you're filming in Ethiopia, why don't you tell about Ethiopians in Ethiopia? So one of the issues is, are people willing to hear the stories of others who don't look like them? We can have a kind of a prejudice where we only pay attention to the issues in the people who look like us. Whereas, if you're really going to be global, in, in, and I think globalization is a part of what Snow College wants to do. President Cook is very aware of inter international issues and wanting the students to participate in those. It can't be, I want to work with you so that you can be like me. It's, I want to learn from you. I want to see what you do that works in your community. One thing I definitely know in Congo is the sense of family, where it's, they, 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 my godson would say, this is my brother. Well, I guess you would call him my uncle, but we don't have those distinctions here. He is my brother. And, and it just, it spreads all over. When a baby is born, everybody takes care of the baby. There is so much to learn from that. And if you go with an attitude of, you have so many things to teach me, let's do an exchange where I will help you with the things I have access to, and you have cultural knowledge that I don't have, and I want to learn from you. I don't know how we are on time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>